All right. We are back with Emily Shickley. Thank you so much for coming back to the show. We had such a great time in our first conversation chatting. I got so many interesting feedback about our, about our specific episode and how people actually resonated with it. As you know, most of our listeners are folks who are busy with their tech or biotech or sort of like their corporate jobs. And it was interesting to hear. And it was kind of like uh, beautiful also to hear that, that folks felt so close uh, to that conversation. They kind of like saw themselves. They're like, oh, okay. Like I was in that situation too. And I never like thought there could be like so many layers to it. So that that's that's what I'm excited about to kind of like continue sort of that conversation. Also, we recently met at our favorite coffee shop and we had a conversation as we were like planning for a WePo session. Uh, we had a great conversation there about a interesting topic. I don't want to spoil it. And I'm like, I told you that, hey, Emily, we should be uh, having another recording, I think. I think it's about time. So thank you for saying yes to that uh, request. Uh, I appreciate it. Excited to have you back. And I want to start this conversation with this question. Like when we chatted last time, um, I'm curious, what was the uh, impact of that conversation on you? What did you, how did you leave that conversation? And what have you been up to since then? I'm so glad you asked that question. I love the continuity thread too, not only for us to reflect on that, but also for our listeners to hear it. So if you didn't have the pleasure of listening to that first conversation, I highly recommend going back and listening to it. It was gold. And uh, in particular, because we recorded it in person. And I think that was, it was definitely new for me. I'd never recorded a podcast in person. And I think it was, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, like relatively newer for you, uh, given who you've talked to in the past. They're not necessarily local. Yeah. And there's so many layers of meaning to that, of being able to have a conversation like that in person in our local community that I feel really do tie in to what we're going to talk about today in this, I, in this lens of deeper connection, of celebrating that almost old school, human to human, in-person connection that I feel like a lot of people are craving. I've been talking to a lot of friends and clients and relatives who I've noticed are for lack of a better word, like almost like meerkats kind of popping up and realizing these various hobbies or various communities that they used to be a part of before the pandemic. And now they're really longing for that connection and especially for a person. So it's interesting because I feel like that conversation trying to place it in my mind on the timeline, but I sometime around there or after there, or like right before there hosted my, uh, the ceremony that I've been stewarding in person for the first time. And it just gave me so much life. It really did. And so I have been more and more thinking about how to really celebrate local community and support not only, you know, wonderfully talented speakers like Ali here, and also the people in the community who maybe don't realize that actually you don't have to necessarily travel far to get access to that kind of connection. That so much resonates with me uh, from two ways. One is just observing what you have been doing recently. And also thanks for showing up to our WePause session that that was one way you applied this principle. And secondly, I think uh, one thing that um, COVID, like after COVID math gave us was the opportunity to rethink uh, the connections that we have to this world. And I think this is such a beautiful way of like looking back and say, you know what? Now I need to restart this connection to where I belong, or at least where I live for the time being. Some of us are nomads and we don't have 
any place to call home, but maybe the entire place and the entire world is home. I don't want to get to that conversation, but the point being is like reconnecting and rethinking how we are connected to mm -hmm. the world around us. I think that's such a beautiful world uh, to have around us. Um, thank you for sharing that. I'm kind of like uh, curious and I've been thinking about like how to uh, really restart that conversation <laughs> we had uh, in the coffee shop. And I think the best way to go to it is by just reminding all of us of the world that we are living in right now. Like uh, to the professionals out there, to fo those who are f working right now, it's not like a uh, new topic. In the past two years, we've been seeing a lot of unfortunate uh, layoffs and changes in the corporate dynamic. This definitely comes with a price and comes with a mental health price. And as a matter of fact, that's what this is why I care about this topic. And the burden, I think, is on uh, at least two sides in this game. One is those who are leaving that uh, corporate or that job that they're at which the impact can be so varied depending on their life situations. And then <laughs> the second group is those who are staying in that org uh, and like having and tolerating all that stress of possibly losing their jobs and how to deal with that. I cannot tell you how many conversations I had in the past few months. And these conversations are just growing. Like my friends who are listening to this conversation, they might be like, oh yeah, we just talked to Ali last week about this topic. And yes, they are right. Because uh, the, the, the amount of these conversations are growing. The amount of worries about what happens if I get uh, uh, laid off in the next riff. And what happens if that, what happens to this mortgage that I have? What happens to the family? And all these big, painful questions that are just going to happen in a second. like. In a second, you're not going to be in that job anymore. And so many ripple effects of that coming out. So that, I think, is just like this. I, I wanted to define like this picture. Hopefully, that's, that's a familiar yeah. picture. Unfortunately, that's a familiar picture for all of us. Um, let's start from there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you for sharing that and opening with that. And I think that it absolutely ties into what we were just talking about with this idea of connection in the sense that regardless of whether you are in person connected to your colleagues or not, and you're working remotely, connection knows no space and time. So even though we were, I, I think it's important to name, like even though we were spouting the ideals of an in-person community connection to the physical place where you are and the the people like the bodies you can actually interact with in the 3d connection is not limited by that and also as humans we have this near constant tap into our collective unconscious so when you're talking about whether or not you're the person who's still at the company or you're the person who's laid off on a nervous system level and on an unconscious mind level, we don't actually know that we are separate from each other. And I could get into the science of that, uh, but I think there's a much more interesting conversation to be had on kind of the energetic level of it. But I do recommend if you are curious to learn more, you can look look into how mirror neurons work. Uh, you can look into all of the amazing research about ancestral uh, and generational experiences that have been inherited, whether they're everyday experiences or, or traumatic experiences. And when we think about this very real and tangible situation with, with layoffs, for example, and the near constant wonderings of, will this happen to me? You can see how, because we on an unconscious level relate so primally to other humans who we find some kind of 
affinity towards, whether it's they're on the same team, they're in a similar role, or they just work for the same company where you have some rapport with them, you like them, you're friends with them. When we see other people experiencing pain and falling into, say, a time of lack and scarcity, it feels almost, it can feel almost the same as if it's happening directly to us on an unconscious nervous system level. And so that's what I mean by like the collective unconscious in the sense that like when we see someone else who we relate to experiencing something hard, we can feel it in our bodies. And this is not just true for empaths. And when we're thinking about something like a job, because of our modern world, so much of our survival hinges upon whether we have that sustainable, constant influx of money, right? And not only that, but like, if you think about, especially with larger tech companies or larger corporations that have heavily invested time, energy, and resources into helping people identify as being a person who not just works at this place, but is the place where they work, right? Without naming any names, I'm sure our audience can think of some tech companies, right? That will, employees will refer to themselves as a, you know, name of company, company at an ER at the end, uh, which is basically reducing your identity as a very multifaceted human being into an employee. And so you can imagine if there's all of this time, energy, and resources that goes into that, of course, there are like some really wonderful benefits of creating these identity markers uh, for team collaboration and communication. You know, I'm not saying it's all bad, but then if you take that away, what are they left? And I've had conversations with clients and, and prospective clients about this where they were recently laid off. They had worked for a company for 10 plus years. They had met their partner there. They had friends there. They ate the food there. They worked out there. You know, they saw their therapist there. They got back adjustments there. Their kids went to daycare. You know, it's like there are so many layers and investments in the job these days, especially if you work for a company like that. And so then seeing other people or experiencing yourself being laid off immediately puts us into that like dysregulated state of, oh, wow. It's not just the job that a person is lost, it's their entire identity. And so of course we would be dysregulated. Of course we would be thrown off by it. Of course we would be having these constant worries and thoughts, regardless of whether it actually happened to us or just someone we know. Yeah. This, um, the, the, so as we were saying, there's like two aspects to it. I want to dig a little bit into like the second one, that uh, losing that identity. and what we are hearing from friends who are working at those big companies or even smaller companies, um, no one is immune in the given and uh, in, in the current market. Um, and it's kind of like industry agnostic, even at this point, like you, you hear news from almost all industries that kind of like boomed within the last 10 years. And now you see them crashing for whatever reason, that is not my expertise, but, no one is Im immune, and uh, you hear these conversations that, oh, then what should I be doing? And I don't think I can find another job like that. I don't think anyone would hire me in this environment. I don't think uh, I would have enough runway to go for X month or X years without um, having a stable job. Even the worst news that we are hearing right now is you now started hear, started seeing people who got laid off like late 2022 and they're getting laid off again in a matter of a year or 15 months. And they're expecting, even if they find anything, they're going to be. And now for them, it becomes like this entire uh, lack of security about their job, which is um, 
completely understandable. It's really uh, scary. But I think the bigger uh, scaring point behind it is that continuous change of identity. As someone who jumped from companies to one another in the past, I can really uh, understand this feeling that like, while every company was like trying to create an identity for me, every time I was going to another company, it was breaking and it, I could feel like a, in, a shift inside me. I don't want to label it, whether it's good or bad, but it was, it was a burden. It was a lot. And now mm. what's the solution? Is it, is it to, and I don't want to just jump to a solution domain. Maybe we can start thinking about more sides of the problem, but like, I think, what's the solution? Should we just not associate with anything? Should we just not associate with any corporate or any job that we are doing? Should we rethink how we are looking at our jobs? What What is it here that maybe needs to change or be, get improvements so that we can cope with these situations better? Yeah. Um, I don't know if you want to jump to a solution or you want to <laughs> keep opening the problem. I think that's that's up to you. Yeah, I I think it's... I think it's helpful to talk about the why a little bit more and, and flesh that out for folks. So with this example of people getting laid off and then 15 months later getting laid off again, that experience can also bring up lots of deep wounding that on like a primal human level affects the psyche and our mental health, which I think is important to talk about given we're on the Alice show. <laughs> In the sense that the need to belong, which is also what you're speaking to with your own personal experience, is one of our basic needs as humans. We are a tribal species. We can't actually survive without each other. If you think about it on a basic level, unless you are a highly skilled one person, sustainable farmer out in the wilderness and you get all your own food. Yeah, you could probably survive, but you also may lose your mental health because humans are not meant to be in isolation. We're not that type of species. And so from a from an understanding of that need of being of belonging somewhere as being so primal it it shows up in as early as childhood in the sense that we crave a sense of belonging so that our needs are met like that is a primal need within us and if our needs aren't met by our caregivers and our community, then we can take on certain wounding and identity markers like I am not enough, or there's something wrong with me. And that's why I'm being rejected. And then if you fast forward to being an adult, and you experience repeated layoffs, that's touching on that basic wounding of wow, there's something wrong with me. So often we turn the outside world inwards in the sense that we look at ourselves like, oh, there's something wrong with me because I'm the pattern as opposed to the market is off, right? And I think there's, there's a need for both in the sense of taking personal responsibility and also recognizing external circumstances. So I think it's important to to kind of touch on that idea that like belonging is a basic human need. And so then when we look at this identity piece of joining a company and taking on that identity there, it's not just that, you know, capital C big corporate, you know, is coming in and, and telling us to do that. It's, there's actually like a basic human need to feel like you belong and then you're spending upwards of eight hours, maybe fewer than that, but at work or and or within the realm of work, whether it's physical or virtual. And of course, you want to feel like you belong. And then added to that, like your life's basic needs, because it's your salary source, are also at stake here. So there's this like 
double emphasis on the need to assimilate to a new identity, right? As like someone who works at this place. And then if someone's having uh, repeated layoffs or by choice moving different companies, like, yeah, of course that would be impacting you, right? So it's interesting in these conversations that I've had with people who have been laid off about now they're stripped of this identity. It's like, what is left? So if we're going to start to shift into solution territory, I think the key is to notice and become aware of this tendency and need to belong to external communities and at the same time, cultivate your own internal community with yourself, your own sense of identity, your own sense of sovereignty and agency so that you can remember that actually none of us are separate and also you are still your own self that's apart from whatever happens at work or whatever happens with your family. Like if you're not working, so many parents, right, self-identify as the parent as opposed to also their other multifaceted identities and can get lost in that. So I think this spans more than the work conversation. And also there is that like double element here with with work in the sense that it's like both the need to belong and also to have your basic needs met through your salary yeah it's what it reminds me is uh, this experience i ha had and i still have uh since last april when i quit my job and it was interesting like i was at a recruiting recruiting tech company um, it was an online solution for finding good candidates. And I saw things changing. And one thing that I told myself is like, your mental health is not at a good state. Do you want to be in a situation where you're also going to be exposed to more stress that you're not built to even handle it? I know you can't, given the circumstances. And, or do you want to just, let go of it and i think that experience of letting go uh, was reminded to me based on what you are saying right now i think that it was a tough decision but it came uh, down to this kind of like simple question what do i want and what does work for me in that situation given my uh, uh mental health and some of the other characteristics and then what when when the time starts, the second thing from the same experience, when the time started, when the so-called sabbatical time started, um, I started just seeing that and even waking up sometimes that, oh, uh, I need to do something. But, oh, no, it's not. I don't have to check Slack anymore. I don't have to check a work email anymore. I actually don't have a meeting today exciting or stressed mm -hmm. at some point uh, i gotta be uh, transparent like there were days that i went to like these kind of like depressive mood some may define it that oh what am i doing today and then slowly as, as i started like filling up these days with having a more regular workout plan having more meditation and having recording of meditations for my other podcast recording of this podcast talking to folks like you to plan these calls and like doing things that i liked to do cooking healthy food like i can say like over 85 percent of the meals i ate since quit my job are healthy so at least i didn't eat that much out anymore and all the thing i made everything almost at home like spending more of the time there it's so interesting looking back i'm like shit like i wake up and i am working but working for myself like i i made an intentional decision to work for myself and work on myself and investing that time for me again something that i heard that you are saying uh and the only thing that and it's interesting to see like comparing time to time like the delta of the time i'm spending i'm like how do my days even go 
And then I look back and I see like, oh yeah, you're cooking for this long. You're going to gym for this time. You're doing this, you're doing that. That's like eight hours. You're spending all that eight hours on yourself. I mean, good for you. It's a decision you made. And now, like recently, I've been starting like this feeling that lack of belonging. Okay, I mm. actually really need to belong to something. I really need to have my uh, tribe or my people to start caring about, which I'm changing that a little bit by spending more consulting time and like working with people, doing creative stuff together to make things happen. Um, I, I just wanted to share this picture and to see if any of that, and of course, like I was not laid off, but I left job for at least for a long time and these are the symptoms that i've been observing again don't want to label them as good or bad but like does any of that resonate and is that is that is that the scenario that we are all potentially can go through <laughs> yeah absolutely resonates and i think a few things i want to name as well in the sense that a lot of folks who quote unquote get out of the full-time gig, whatever that full-time gig is, will oftentimes share their story. And then people who are still in it are like, oh, well, that's the only way right, that I can be free. And I'll share a little bit of my own story too, to kind of like counteract that as well. And maybe some tips that, that might be helpful for people to realize that actually you don't have to burn everything down in order to create more personal freedom and sovereignty. And also it can be helpful and sometimes it's necessary, right? So there really is this both and here. It's not just like become an entrepreneur and you'll solve all your problems <laughs> because it's not for everybody, you know? So I, I love that you shared that and, and kind of the waves that you navigated in your own journey. And I feel like there really is this detoxification process that happens, whether it is that you get laid off, you choose to leave, or you just decide to be different, right? That you're just done with being constantly plugged into this I'm never going to do enough. I'm never going to earn enough. I'm never going to work enough. If I work hard, then maybe I'll be rewarded, but then the rewards aren't coming. And what if I'm going to lose my job, right? All of that kind of dysregulated scarcity survival brain messaging. So I started my business in 2018 and it wasn't until 2022 February of 2022, that I actually left my full-time role. And by that time, I was working way more than full-time <laughs> and with all the things happening. And yet I had this risk-averse feeling come up where I felt like, oh, well, leaving corporate was so terrifying. And part of that, I think, was that there's this uh, really kind of poetic saying that I think is helpful to name. I, I can't properly attribute it. I think it's Florence uh, Scovelshin, but it's that we will choose a familiar hell over an unfamiliar heaven every time, <laughs> right? In the sense that like, it took me a really long time to realize, oh, actually, I have done, quote, enough in my business to allow myself the permission to dream a different reality and to bring it to fruition. And then ironically, all of 2022, I was over-functioning in my business about helping people overcome burnout <laughs> because all of the ways of working from big corporations, from uh, the kind of quote unquote stu good student drama that I, that I picked up, right, um, from childhood were so ingrained in me that I, that I didn't, that I knew I wanted something different, but I didn't know how to create the different thing. So even though I spent more time in the morning luxuriating in my meditative practices 
I still felt like I was constantly working and that I needed to be constantly working. And when I wasn't working, I felt like I really should be working, especially because there was no one else working. <laughs> so it is amazing how, unless we do an intentional like detoxification process of like this program of we have to constantly be doing things or we have to constantly be available or we have to constantly be working to avoid scarcity. And I think that happens whether or not you leave your job or, or start your own business or you stay in it. And there are practices that you can do to create more spaciousness between your self identity and your work identity, which I think is kind of like what we're getting at rather than conflating the two all the time and thinking that like your worth is defined by how much you do. I think that's a really common program <laughs> that I, that I encounter both in myself and also in clients. And I think it can be overwhelming to look at that like, well, this is all I've known, right? This is my familiar hell, so to speak. So how do we start to shift that? And a lot of that lies in starting with the body, right? And oftentimes we forget that our body has so much wisdom and has access to so much more wisdom than our conscious mind does. And so simple practices like the beautiful meditations, you know, that Ali has been leading, uh, or going for a walk and actually really establishing yourself in the present. Like it sounds cliche to just list all the self-care things, but if you do it with intentionality and continue to anchor in your nervous system that like you deserve this because you are a human, not because you're trying to regain energy to then go work more, right? There is a difference there. So in my own experience, I've found that there's this detoxification, this unraveling, deprogramming process, whatever you want to call it, before you can really access that new self-identity that's either apart from work or can collaborate with your work identity, but is not synonymous with it. It is interesting to see it this way, and I can attest that's how the journey has been for me too. Uh, but it's interesting to see that it's as simple as this. you got to start finding yourself. And to find yourself, you got to first start finding your body. Once you found your body, you find the connections you have to this world. You redefine those connections if, if needed. That connections mean the friends and the network you have around you, the places you go and spend time whether you used to spend a lot of time in that office from eight in the morning sometimes in the company you and I we both work sometimes I was going to the office so early and leaving so late that was how I was connected to that to this work um, I don't have to spend all of that time there maybe once I found my body once I found my connection to myself so genuinely and simply Maybe I see that my body needs to spend more time in the nature, backpacking here sometimes, detaching sometimes and just spend more time, I don't know, in the mountains or no, in the specific countries, going to specific cities to visit my friends because that's what brings me joy uh, and through the connections I found in this world. So I, I really love the focus on our body first because it feels like it has all the answers i know you and i we we keep repeating this in so many other conversations but i feel like our body has all the answers and once we start like focusing on that body however it works for us because it, it's not the same for everyone some people found it find it by going doing like heavy jujitsu or like martial arts. Some people find it through like yoga. Some people find it through however it is to find their body um, by losing weight and like taking and figuring out medications they need to do for their specific types of things that they never paid attention to. Going to 
uh, regular checkups, that's also paying attention to your body, um, going to cleaning our teeth, like as simple as that. Like oftentimes being so dedicated to work, it just like disconnects us from our body for a reason. One, one other thing I wanted to call out, which I think impacts us not paying attention to our body and like keep uh, putting more on our body is like when I think of like my uh, heavy working time, I feel like I was always like trying to find and like prove something mm -hmm. that in my job rather than proving it in, a, in my own life to myself. Like, yes, I could be like the employee of the year, but what did it bring to me? rather than I could be the Ali of the year for me, <laughs> you know, like how could, how could I really take care of my body that could just make me so happy when I look at myself and say, oh, great, you did a good job in the past year. You lost X much and gained X much muscle instead and you feel healthier. Your cholesterol level is lower. I'm so proud of you, dude. Like we could replace that. And I think because of like the reward system that exists in some of the work and because of so many other things that you know better than me, we just place all those pressure on our work persona, as you were saying, like on our work character that we have, rather than splitting it between so many things. Um, so that's, that's how uh, I, I felt about like some of the things you shared. I'm curious, how was that for you? Like how, like once you started, actually, we can play with examples in your own journey once you start like paying more attention to your body what happened yeah i shared in the last episode what was happening when i wasn't paying attention to my body <laughs> with a lot of chronic pain and i think the especially if someone is experiencing discomfort in the body there's this tendency to to not look at it right to shut it down to shove it away put it in the closet metaphorically and I found the biggest antidote to being, to actually being in my body is curiosity. And I, I find that it's actually the opposite of stress as well, because when we're in a stress state, we don't have access to our prefrontal cortex and our creative thinking skills. We're st instead focused on external circumstances, right? We have an external focus on survival. And when we bring in curiosity, like, oh, what's like, how, how am I feeling right now? Just that simple question of actually asking yourself that can do wonders for getting in your body. And so for me, I feel like I began this journey of, cur of curiosity and play. And instead of putting a spotlight on whatever success supposedly meant outward success in my business, it was more like, how can my North Star be the process of play? And that's where the real creative juice came from. And also where I figured out what I actually loved rather than just following a blueprint that, you know, some successful entrepreneur says I have to do in my business in order to, you know, reach a certain monetary figure or whatever, or, you know, even following the corporate model. I feel like I spent so many years just like, gobbling up information about how I quote unquote should do business. Ironically, when the whole point of starting a business beyond making an impact was to set myself free and create my own reality. So I think it's very common. And I think oftentimes we don't even realize we're doing it. And it took me a long time to realize that I was doing it until my body told me, hey, this is not working. You gotta slow down, girl, you know. And so I think curiosity for me was, was a huge antidote and this idea that I could play my way through business, through my life and kind of approach things from this beginner's mindset, from this like curiosity mindset of like, oh, how does this feel? Do I like it? Do I not like it? Do I like it later? <laughs> Do I not like it ever? And then that in itself, that kind of play mindset, mindset builds self-trust and when we build deeper self-trust we step more into that i am energy that i am consciousness of knowing who you actually are at your core as like a living breathing spiritual being in a human body having a human existence whereas if we're not ever getting curious 
we're stuck in that familiar hell territory. We're just, we're just the computer playing the program over and over and over again that we've been trained into and rewarded by following for the earlier years in our lives. So I think for me, like that, that was the biggest internal shift was just like treating everything like a giant curiosity experiment and allowing that to show me, oh, okay, here's me, right? And here's not me. Here's me and here's not me. So I think when we ask ourselves this question of like, who am I really? It can be easy to fall into either old programs of who other people say you are or like an existential crisis and a dark night of the soul. So I like to treat things with a lot of like playful curiosity. Uh, And I find that it loosens the grip on these old programs. The other thing that I'll share too briefly is that in this playful experiment, uh, I really found benefit not only of all of these body practice, spiritual practices that I've talked about before, but also Uh, internal family systems. So like really acknowledging that there are multiple parts within me that want different things and have different needs and maybe got stuck at certain ages of my life and are now stuck in my body. And if, you know, you're listening and you're not really sure what that means, like if you think about like your inner child as a concept, your inner critic as a concept, which may feel more tangible and familiar to you. We also have you know, the, the work worker bee or whatever the, that persona name is as a, as a part of ourselves too. And so working consciously with that part and asking like, Hey, how are you doing? You know, what do you need right now? Uh, what is it that you're wanting to do? And kind of bridging, uh, bridging the gap between all those parts that are inside of you at any given time so that you feel a greater sense of wholeness can also help with with finding the, that I am energy. That was so beautiful. And this reminded me of the last uh, we pause session that we have live right now. Uh, mm-hmm. so we pause 10, where we were talking about like uh, giving the pen to our inner child. And I used the example as um, I, I called my inner child la which is short for uh, little ali and sometimes it's so fascinating little ali has a lot of good answers to a lot of his needs and it's uh it just became a routine for me now in my morning pages i if i if i get stuck and i need uh something out of the box i'm like hey little ali what do you think and it's so interesting as soon as i type he has the answer or at least and his answers are like very interesting um they are very simple they're like oh you're looking here look there and it's so interesting like how simple and playful those answers are i just wanted to call that out are there any activities like this that i called out like the morning pages are there any other activities that you would recommend for folks to kind of like in this journey that they have, whether they lost their job, uh, whether they quit intentionally um, and for other reasons or no, whether they're still at work and they're just battling with these feelings and lack of connection, lack of connection to this world per se, mm-hmm. or lack of connection to themselves uh, because of all this stress. Are there any kind of like practices that you would recommend to help bringing those inner conversations out in a very organized way so it's not overwhelming. I know therapy is one solution, but we know everybody is right now, if they're laid off, they are applying and they are doing this, doing that, doing that. They may say, Ali, Emily, we don't have time for therapy. We don't have money for therapy. Are there any activities that we can introduce to our folks to kind of like connect to that? inner child, inner personas, not just the inner child. Yes, absolutely. And I I loved that We Pause episode that you did. So if if y'all haven't experienced Ali's magic about being an artist, highly recommend you check it out. It's fun. Yeah. So this is a great question. So let's, 
let's maybe pick someone, one of these people, uh, fictitiously. So say you are still working and your friend is laid off or your teammates are laid off and, and you're wondering and you're kind of spiraling. Or if you're laid off and then there's a moment in your day where you start spiraling, right? So just imagine whatever your like archetype that you resonate with right now. Maybe you're a parent and you're wanting to get a job, right? And you're spiraling, whatever it is. See if you can stop whatever activity you're doing and take a moment out. So, you know, if you're in a public setting, go somewhere else. Like it could be a bathroom stall. Like it doesn't have to be, you know, this <laughs> whole magical meditation space. You don't have to wait till the end of the day, right? And then just check in and ask yourself, ooh, okay, like what part of me is activated right now? Like what part of me is saying those things? And some people, it's easier to check in and see what part of your body is feeling tension in that moment. And some people who are not used to locating feelings in the body might find it helpful to imagine maybe if that thought that you have of like, I'm going to get laid off too, or I'm next, or I'll never find another job again. Ask, what is the age of that part of you that's asking that question? And then start to form either a picture in your mind's eye, or if you're not super into visualization, you can just kind of imagine that part of you and see if you can connect with them and ask like, oh, you know, sweet part or, you know, whatever you want to call like little Ali, <laughs> little Emily, like, I see you. I see that you're really you know, having a hard time right now. Yeah, it's scary, right? And so there's this like validation that's needed to acknowledge the feeling because so often when we shove it down, actually it just makes it worse. So like validating that feeling that the part is happening, maybe naming it so it's not just swirling around in your brain. And then asking like, what do you need to feel safe right now? And maybe it's, maybe safe isn't the word that resonates. Maybe it's calm. What do you need to feel at peace with this? Or what do you need to feel like you're being heard finally, right? Whatever it is that that part of you is really yearning for. And then honor that, right? So maybe it's like, I need to go for a walk. Or maybe it's like, I need to take a nap when I get home. Or maybe it's, I need to not read the news. Or turn off my phone for an hour. Or meditate for two minutes. And then honoring that need as opposed to shutting it down is going to do wonders for healing. Not only your relationship to yourself, but also yourself in entirety as well. And then if you're feeling really activated, it can be helpful to do some kind of like nervous system regulating practice. So if you're in fight, something like shaking can be really helpful, or you can get like a, if you're at home and have space, you can get a towel wet and like beat the wall. <laughs> it's really satisfying. Or like, you know, punch a pillow is kind of the cliche. You can do a silent scream or something like that. And if you're in flight, like if you're feeling like really anxious thoughts, that bilateral tapping that I think we taught in the last episode can be really helpful where you cross your arms over your chest and you tap your right hand on your left shoulder and your left hand on your right shoulder repeatedly just to calm your nervous system can be really helpful. And if, same thing if you're in freeze, you can also do like an eye open meditation or wrap yourself in a blanket. And if you're in fawn, maybe it's like telling someone who feels safe what you actually need as opposed to shutting that voice down, which can happen so frequently when we're in font. So just kind of this process of stopping and asking yourself, like getting curious, like, huh, what part of me is activated right now? What do they need? How can I validate them and meet that need? And then come back to a regulated state so that you have access to your 
full self after that practice. And it doesn't have to take a long time. Like sometimes people are like, oh, I don't have time to feel my feelings. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's part of being human. And that, you know, that's the lie of being human is that we think we don't have time to feel our feelings, but they're being felt regardless. And if you look at the science, it actually each emotion is a, a 90 second biochemical reaction. So if you give yourself permission to actually fully feel that feeling without attaching a story to it, it will move through you. So it doesn't have to be like a full hour. You can do this in just a couple minutes and it will do wonders. And if it's a really big feeling, of course, you want to make sure that you have that space and time to re-regulate afterwards and take care of yourself and reach out to support if needed. Thank you so much. This was a thorough answer to uh, my question. And it was kind of like meditative to me. Um, before this call, um, I told you that I'm trying to take a no meeting June uh, plan. Um, and uh, the reason that I was thinking of that is like, I was just feeling that in the past few months since I left my job, I've been like too much exposed. As I said earlier, I said like having all these conversations, having uh, for a reason, for a very good reason. But like my calendar started like getting full. I was like spending a lot of time with friends and others and just hearing their thoughts, like trying to answer so many questions. I was like going to a lot of like therapy sessions and looking for answers to so many things or looking for better questions. And I just felt like in the past few days, I just felt maybe I need to pause all of this because it's just now overwhelming. I need a time off of communicating. And folks who know me, they know that I love chatting, but maybe it's time to pause chatting. And how do you think of like these more of an extreme uh cuts like i know folks who like cut off social media for a month or, or don't do something for a month or i know somebody who's going to woods for a few weeks and just like cutting connections how do you think about like these more of a little bit of an extreme and i know it's not doable for a lot of folks given their circumstances and things that they deal with the family but is there any value in doing these things and what's the best way to prep for them if any love that shift and i love that you're drinking your own medicine and taking your own pause so naming that celebrating that that's really important and surprisingly harder to do than we like to admit and with regards to this idea of like a more drastic cut or, or I should say maybe an intentional cut it doesn't necessarily have to be drastic. That's more of like a subjective reality. I think it can, I think it can be different for each person. So for me personally, I, I don't engage with the news, which is kind of maybe a vulnerable thing to say and a very privileged thing to say. I still receive information about current events, but it's through a filter, another person, my lovely partner. <laughs> And that's intentional because if my energy body is filled up with that information constantly as a sensitive person, I'm not able to actually create or serve in the way that I'm meant to. And I think, you know, I've had clients who have a hard time letting go of, say, social media, and especially with these turbulent times that can be really dysregulating for the nervous system. And we don't even need to tell you all about, you know, the dopamine hits that using this kind of technology in that way constantly can give us and kind of perpetuate us. And so if you look at, you know, different organizations that have been really supportive for uh, people who have this need to engage with something, whether it's technology or TV or constant meetings or constant work, right? This kind of like compulsion, if you will, it can be really helpful to just take a reset. And if you think about what we were talking about with this detoxification process, it, I don't think I could have done that if I still 
was overworking both at my employee role and also in my business. Because when our mind is busy doing the same thing and stuck into the same program, then we don't need to look closely, right? We don't need to get curious. And cultivating that curiosity and like play mindset is really challenging in the noise of the everyday because you need to belong and you need to make your needs, you know, be met, right? Like you got to make those basic needs. And so I think there's a lot of value with taking a reset, whether it's, you know, a month of no meetings for you, or I'm going to go to uh, a cabin in the woods for three weeks, which I'm very excited about. Only one of those weeks will be like a complete solo retreat uh, for creative purposes, but I'll be in a completely different environment than I'm in right now. And I think there's a, there's something, <laughs> I don't know, maybe this sounds too, too wild and out there, but there's, there's almost something primal about it that I feel it's this like whether it's an external or like an inner migration, it's almost like a migratory experience. Like if you think about even the seasonality here with our school system in you know the West, it's like there's a summer break because the mind needs a break and people want to travel and go do different things and get out, right? And so I think there's something really familiar in a way of like, choosing an extreme and also honestly it makes boundaries a little bit easier right it's almost easier to decide i'm not going to look at social media for a month than i'm only going to look at social media for five minutes every day right there's there's something that's like clear cut about like whether it's a retreat or a no, I'm not going to do this thing or yes, I'm going to do this thing. I'm like that's, there's a reason why challenges are so just irresistible and like tasty to humans, you know, cause it has like this finite period. We get this adrenaline rush. We get this like focus, right? We've set these clear boundaries. There's some kind of accountability at play. And so I think there's absolutely a benefit. And I think the most important thing even beyond just prepping for it is like integration because so many times, especially in just our everyday lives, we'll go and we'll travel somewhere and we'll be like a completely different person with our vacation mindset and then come back home and, and think everything's going to be different, but it just, you know, hits play again. So I think it's thinking about, well, how do you integrate the pause? So, you know, just asking you on the spot, Ali, <laughs> Like, what is, what do you think? Like, and just anticipating, like, what do you think for you is the, is kind of the integration from a no meeting month? Like, it is, is it just that this is a pause and you're going to press play again and it's going to go back to how it was? Or do you anticipate maybe some things coming out of the pause that then invite you to change the pace? Yeah. I <laughs> want to start by calling out how, this setting is familiar where separation, initiation, uh, and return. It's like we are consistently living our own hero journey. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks to Joseph Campbell for extracting this simple yet super important pattern. And I think like my, my idea is like the way we are living it is it's not just a one time. We don't have like one hero's journey. For some, this can happen on a weekly basis, or this can happen even shorter or longer. And I think this is, for me, it's, it's one of those hero's journey where I need to separate from the comfortable. I need to get a little bit uncomfortable by not having necessarily the conversations that seem so comfortable and easy to me, uh, the conversations that I can be great at it and like get the applause or get the feedback that I need. I need to live the question. And I think that's where my calling is as far as like, okay, maybe you need to then just figure out your questions. Maybe you need to set up your questions better before going again, coming back with good questions and receive answers. So I think what I will be coming back, hopefully, in, in my return. In this initiation, I'm looking for 
better questions. And hopefully when I come back, it's a, it doesn't mean there's going to be less meeting, but I think meeting is just one of those uh, tools that I've been using to consistently get answers. I'm kind of like cutting the process to receive answers so efficiently. Like these calls, as you know, I've, I've told you and all my other guests and friends that these are so valuable calls for me to get answers so quickly, so efficiently, and in such a lovely setting. But by cutting some of these, I'm not exposing myself to answers anymore. Then that forces me to ask better questions, come up with new set of questions and live those questions and come back. Maybe that means meetings as usual. Maybe that means meetings in a different setting. I only meet with people in person or I don't know what, what's going to change. But I think like having that open mind after this very important initiation for me is a must so I can uh, have a uh, useful return more than anyone for myself. Beautiful. I love that. I love that idea of having an intention of coming up with better questions. And that questions in and of themselves are answers. That's that's how I feel about it. And that's been the theme that I've been following in the past uh, few weeks. Because um, oftentimes I thought I have the answers to everything. And one, th one of the things that I'm also like discovering in my therapy is like some of the rush that I have to always get to an answer. Maybe, maybe that's the kind of like mm. blocker for me to figure out Ali better. So as, as part of this journey, uh, I think maybe it's time to pay attention more to the questions, relive the questions, rethink the questions and so on. So hopefully this makes sense. If not, like when I'm back, I have more to say. Um, <laughs> so the good thing is like when we are recording this, this episode is going to go live in June. I have another recording for early July, so I'm still going to have the content to tell some of this story. Um, we'll see. We'll see what happens then. I want to also be uh, so thankful of this conversation to you, Emily. Thank you so much for coming back to the show. This was so great to have you, and it's always joy for me to chat with you as a friend. Thank you for um joining us again any final thoughts anything that you want to share with our audience um we would love to hear it yeah so i can't share too many details which is maybe the best but i have reserved a space and i'm going to be hosting a one and a half day experience with guest speakers and the theme is play and so I have like a working title, which is Play Fest, <laughs> that maybe gives some of the energy of it. I love that. <laughs> yeah. And the, the main intent behind it is exactly what we're talking about. It's this like antidote to what I call grid energy of like being plugged in to all of these old mindsets of like having to constantly do and work and seek approval. And because I've personally, as I mentioned, found so much benefit to this like curiosity and play-based mindset, not only for my own nervous system and capacity to explore unfamiliar territory, and also to discover who I really am and what lights me up. And I feel like this is really a, a very much needed experience. And also I have some beautiful teachers around this theme that I want to highlight as well. So if you're in the Bay Area, save the dates, October 19th and 20th. It is happening. Details pending. Yes. Um, and I'm very excited about it. It'll be in Redwood City. So right in the middle of the peninsula. The other idea that is part of it is it's there are so many people I feel on the peninsula who feel like they have to go to the city or the East Bay in order to access this kind of play, right? This time, this kind of experiment and exploration of self. And I don't think that that's has to be true. And, and I think that there, there really is a need for it, especially for folks in the Bay area 
and especially during this time. And all are welcome too. So if you want to make it a, a trip <laughs> and you don't live here, come on out. It's going to be a good time. So yeah, I'm excited about that. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I will share links to your website. And when we have your event link, we'll also add it both to the show note and I will share it on wherever social and our newsletters. Uh, so folks can uh, get more details on it. Uh, thank you so much again. Is there any other final thoughts, anything else about the conversation, anything you want to leave our audience with? Because I know you always have like very good little tips to throw <laughs> here and there that are super helpful. The last sound bite, such pressure. <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, yeah, I, I I think the biggest thing is I would encourage you to start to get curious about where this grid energy is most prominent in your life. And that might be a specific place, like a physical place, or it might be a place in your body, or it might be a thought structure that keeps repeating. But really that first step of curiosity can then open you up to a different experience. But without that curious mindset or without taking that pause, whether it's a month-long pause of not talking to people in meetings or being in a cabin in the woods or two seconds in your day, there's so much that can happen in the silence when you get that deeper connection to yourself and get curious about it. So I would say start there, <laughs> start there and see what happens. And if you need support, we're here for you. Uh, definitely let us know what you thought of this conversation. I'm so curious and always open to continuing talking to people. Yeah. Stay Enjoy curious. the pause. Stay curious. Enjoy the pause. I love that. <laughs> Enjoy the pause. Stay curious. And I am so thankful for you to be part of this community and consistently bringing all the great uh, tips and gifts, I would call them always. Uh, I love that uh, a lot of the folks within our community already connected to you. And I know you have conversations. This is such a joy for me to see how this bridging happens and you're, you're all so connected and helping each other. So thank you again. Thanks everyone who have been tuning us to this conversation th thus far. And I hope to see you again on the show, Emily, and have a great day. Thank you. Such a pleasure to be back. Thanks, everybody, for listening as well. Take care.